Good evening, everybody. Thank you for uh, coming out tonight, and uh, it's, it's an honor for me to be here and talk about uh, radio history here in Nashua. Uh, it, it has changed considerably over the years. Uh, in fact, we have four radio stations in Nashua now. We used to only have three licensed stations. The fourth one is uh, New Hampshire Public Radio. Uh, they have a, a transmitter and tower on top of St. Joseph's Hospital. And even though their broadcasts emanate out of Concord, the transmitter's here, so the license is here. And then WSMN continues to broadcast at 1590. And then you have the old WOTW, which is WMVU and is now WGHM, or ESPN New Hampshire, as they just became known as. And actually, we have five stations, uh, because Frank uh, 106, the old WOTWFM, which became WHOB, they left and went to Hooksit, and when this latest group bought it, they've moved it back there on Murphy Drive. So there are actually five stations, and uh, we actually have more than Manchester, finally. <laughs> Manchester always had five. Uh, Tom Monahan also holds the license for WKBR in Manchester, but the transmitter's up there. Technically, it's Nashua's, but it's, it's Manchester's. But actually, the first radio broadcast in Nashua took place on July 12th, 1934, on WPHB. Now, WPHB was licensed to the National Police Department. And the broadcast was between the headquarters and the department's five cruisers. The communications were one way, and it was Chief Goodwin at the time who did the broadcast as part of an open house at the police department. It wasn't until 1950 that the police department was able to do two-way radio broadcasts. Now today, the police cruisers in Nashville not only have two-way radios, but they have interoperable radios that allow them to talk anywhere in the state of New Hampshire, and they have laptop computers, in which they can write their reports, do a records check or a license check if they stop you, so we've come a long way. The first commercial radio station in Nashua was born on September 13th in 1946 and located on Lund Road, and that was WOTW, 900 on the AM dial. They were a 1,000 watt radio station. The group was comprised of a general manager named Arthur Newcomb, a gentleman by the name of Homer Wingate, Judge Antoine Gurton, and Elmer Blakey. And it was billed as the Gate Cities radio station. And WOTW was named for, Homer, uh, for Wingate's mother, Olena T. Wingate. But it cost the group a little bit of money for that. They had to pay a commercial fishing boat $10,000 for the rights to the call letters. And that represented the cost of painting a new sign on the boat. As I say, the station was located on Lund Road. They were licensed to operate at 1,000 watts of power. And back then, they were allowed to operate from sunrise to sunset. So times changed as daylight savings came and went. Uh, their, their time on the air came and went. Now, some of that early staff included Jim Rohde, Joe Ross, Robert Hughes, Dave Felder. The program director was Jay Sherwin. And the news and sports director is my dad. One of the new programs he brought to the airwaves was a new show, a daily talk show, called Express Your Opinion. Over time, others like Carter Knight and Merrill Smith joined the staff. On March 28, 1948, WOTW had a baby. WOTW FM licensed to operate at 106.3. Now this gave the station the advantage of being on the air after sunset and allowed them to broadcast Nashua High School football and basketball games. A little side note, in 1947, Blakey, Wingate, and Judge Gurton purchased WLNH in Laconia, and in 1958, Nashua's third radio station was born, WSMN 1590, 5,000 watts, and it was launched by Mayor Claude Nichols in his home at 502 West Hollis Street. 
After a brief stint, Nichols sold the station to a group headed by a gentleman called, by the name of Roland Genest. In 1959, the 1590 Broadcasting Corporation bought WSMN. Some notables in the community, Sam Tamposi, Jerry Nash, Dearborn Wingate, Evelyn Early, Sam Bellavance, Roland Lesher, were among the principals that started. And they brought in a gentleman by the name of Al Rock and my father to lead the new group. Someone that was there from day one was a gentleman by the name of Frank Tease. Frank would open the station each morning with the very popular Wake Up Show. Now Frank was a bachelor back then and he lived in Manchester and he would use six alarm clocks <laughs> to ensure that he get up and got down to Nashua on time. And that was good during the fall and the winter season. But in the back of Mayor Nichols' home, he had an old summer house that was a screened in building that he used to socialize and relax in. And we kind of used it for storage. But Frank would sleep out there during the, early, the late spring and, and summer and early fall. So he was saving gas and had to use few alarm, fewer alarm clocks to get to work. An announcer who began his career in Nashua was named Ernie Andrews. His real name is Ernie Anastas. Uh, he left Nashua, went to New York, and he's currently now with Fox TV in New York as their primetime anchorman. Several years ago, he flirted with radio in Nashua. The old WMVU was for sale. He made a brief uh, run with it and purchased it for a little over a year before its current owner, Tom Monaghan, took it over. But getting back to WSMN, such popular programs as Bargain Box, where you could buy, sell, trade, or give it away, could be heard twice daily, along with Another talk show brought there by my dad, 1590 Open Line. And in my opinion, unlike the overuse of breaking news today by some of the news outlets, uh, WSMN had five mobile units that would broadcast live from major incidents in the city and the region. Local news and sports were important, as well as strong editorial stands to issues of interest to Gate City residents. Now, over the years, WSMN's foray into the community included such events as the city's holiday parade. And the one year they were planning to do a Macy's-like holiday parade, it was postponed because that was the same November that President Kennedy was killed. Following a tragic accident involving seniors from Nashville High School en route to the beach in the 60s, WSMN launched the post-prom parties. This was a party for the graduating class of Nashua High to attend. Uh, businesses contributed. The uh, local Ford dealer donated five convertibles that were raffled off to uh, five seniors going to the prom to use that night. And the party was held at the old Garrison Inn which is now home of the 99 restaurant up on Amherst Street. And back in the day, the big band era, the station brought in the likes of Les and Larry Elgart, and Cy Zetner, to play for the seniors. Stereo consoles, televisions, were among the, the raffle prizes that were awarded. After several setbacks, the station we're allowed to broadcast the aldermanic meetings. Some might say the most boring show on radio. <laughs> and that was before TV. But the meetings did grow in length. The aldermen all became orators. And what used to be a 30, 45 minute meeting sometimes lasted into the wee hours of the early morning. <laughs> Part of the deal was that each alderman would have their own microphone and we couldn't control it. It could not have an on-off button. So they were live. And that made for some interesting comments that filtered through. 
But in return, this, we would also provide the city clerk's office at the time with the reel-to-reel -reel tapes of the meeting so they could transcribe and have a permanent verbatim record. When Alan Shepard Jr. became the first man in space, WSMN was at Cape Canaveral. Al Rock, Frank Tees, my dad, and Chief Engineer Don Ears ventured to Florida to broadcast the space flight and lift off live back to New Hampshire. And they were the only New Hampshire broadcast outlet that covered the now famous Reagan-Bush debate at Nashua High School. In fact, Dale Lonroth, Elise Kleiser, and myself spent that whole Saturday over at the high school setting up, and there were a lot of extracurricular things going on. Uh, the Telegraph ran the debate, if you recall, and President Reagan agreed to play by the rules, which was just him and Bush. Well, then the FEC, Federal Elections Commission, said the Telegraph could not pay to sponsor it because that would be an illegal campaign contribution. So the Reagan camp paid for that microphone and the debate. But during the day, thanks to a very close source within the school department administration, we learned that Bob Dole was trying to rent another room in the high school to have a simultaneous debate with the other candidates. Didn't work out, but it was a, certainly a, an interesting day. And one of the things I recalled is that it was the Telegraph's debate, but they didn't have a Sunday paper. This all happened on Saturday night. And by the time the paper came out Monday afternoon, it was old news. Because Monday morning, Reagan fired his entire national campaign staff. And that was grabbing the headlines. And I remember the late Herm Pouliot, who was publisher of the Telegraph, happened to be walking by us as we were wrapping up the broadcast. And uh, we grabbed him and put him on the air. We, we got a comment from him before the paper did. <laughs> but it was an interesting night. And uh, getting back to Frank Tees, you know, it wasn't unusual when he was doing the wake up show to find him sleeping in a window of a downtown Nashville business. He had a penchant for sleeping in the window of Eddie's Bedding and Furniture on Factory Street so that the next morning he would be there in his pajamas doing the wake-up show. <laughs> and he was also known on occasion to sleep in the window of Nashua Supply, which is now the parking lot near Saffron's Bistro on Main Street. For many years, Frank was Santa Claus and did the daily Talking with Santa show live from Osgood's Hardware on East Hollis Street. Many, many other events took place over the years. I can remember as you went in the back door of the old station at 502 West Hollis Street, there was a little alcove off to the right-hand side, and our two-way radio base station was there and the mailboxes for the salesmen. And it was the night of a post-prom party, and Al was sitting there talking to my father, Frank, and a couple of others, and there's a horrendous storm going on outside. Thunder, lightning. And Al had no sooner said, don't worry, if it hits anywhere, it's going to strike the towers first when the building got hit. <laughs> Smoke came spewing out of the sockets. Station went off the air. And uh, he, he lived to regret those words. <laughs> but a similar incident happened. You know, we were very fortunate with the first in the nation primary. We got to see all of the all of the candidates, good, bad, and indifferent. And uh, Senator Kennedy was coming up to uh, be interviewed after he spoke at a chamber breakfast. And uh, the transformer for the power was just outside the front door to the left. And if you recall WSMN's grounds, we had a lot of pine trees. We had a lot of squirrels. And notoriously, from time to time, a squirrel would miss the branch, hit the transformer, and we'd be knocked off the air. Well, the center had no sooner walked through the back door with the Secret Service when a squirrel hit. There was a bang, and you can just imagine. So uh, thanks to tape recorders, which are hardly used today, uh, we sat in the front room, opened the blinds, and we did the interview by natural light. The Secret Service was a little upset. But those were some of the, some of the interesting anecdotes that, that took place over the years. 
1964, the station ventured into the newspaper business with a weekly newspaper, the 1590 Broadcaster, under the direction of Al Rock. And uh, it came out originally, it was this size, and then ultimately grew to the size of what the Boston Herald looks like today. And we can remember the Telegraph writing editorial saying, we didn't stand a chance. Well, those of you who knew Al Rock, you didn't challenge him. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he lived for that. And one of the highlights or signatures of the broadcaster was he signed his front page editorials and, and challenged them to do the same. So thus, uh, a bitter rivalry began, although over the years when my dad was doing news, uh, he, would, uh, he would have a little rivalry going with the editors at the Telegraph. Uh, from time to time. Now, while all this was happening at uh, WSMN across town at WOTW, uh, they ran into a little problem in 1976 when the FCC declined to renew their licenses. And that began a multi-year challenge and a multi-million dollar challenge by about a dozen groups. Because one of the things that the FCC said was they're going to split the licenses. So OTW AM and FM would become two new, and there were about six groups going for, for each of them. And when they went before the administrative judge at the FCC, he basically told them, I don't care what you look like, but come back as one for each. That's when the lawyers made a lot of money. Yeah. In the meantime, uh, before that license uh, renewal was denied, uh, the Newcomb Group sold to another group known as Eastminster Broadcasting. In addition to owning the WOTW stations, they also owned WDNH in Dover, which is now known as WOKQ today, and WCNL in Newport. This new group included uh, national businessman Herb Miller, Phil Lemoy, who owned 20th Century Markets, Pat Bronstein, Mitch Focus, who was owner of Martha's Sweet Shop, Jack Atkinson from Bronzecraft, an attorney, Morris Stein, former mayor Mario Vaggi, and a young lawyer by the name of Warren Rudman. WOTW changed their format to country and western. Mr. Bronstein and his then general manager, Maury Parent, who had started at WSMN on the overnight shift, would do a daily talk show and would, would try to compete with WSMN. In 1978, the FCC awarded the license to Seco Communications, headed by a gentleman by the name of Mike Siegel to operate it in the interim. Siegel brought a gentleman by the name of Woody Woodland to Nashua. Woody would later go on to go back to WSMN, over to WMVU, and back to WSMN again when Tom Monahan bought it. Siegel ran it for about a year and a half, and then the FCC decided on the new ownership for WOTW AM and FM. The AM license went to Merrimack Valley Broadcasting. Some of the principals there included Selma Pastor, Paul Shea, Tom Kelly, Pauline Anderson, Joe Sakey, former Nashville librarian, and they went on the air, and they were known as WMVU. The FM license went to another group that included the former Judge Aaron Harkaway, and they were known as WHOB-FM. WMVU concentrated on local coverage. In fact, when they opened up, they had a staff of 50, and they covered anything that moved. <laughs> That's not the way you start a radio station. You start small and you grow. But they, they were making a concerted effort to be there and be at everything. Uh, meanwhile, WSMN was doing what they did best, covering local news, but they still had that country-western format. Uh, Maury Parent had gone back to WSMN, and following the death of Al Rock, and an interim person as general manager, Ken Albridge, Maury became the general manager. And that's where he uh, worked until he died. WHOB became an adult contemporary station and WMVU concentrated, as I said, on local events. MVU was sold in uh, 1993 to a single owner, 
That gentleman was running it along with several other smaller stations. Uh, and again, because of the technology, he was doing it all by computer pretty much with no local uh, flavor to it. And uh, pretty much all uh, network computer shows that were just being downloaded and broadcast uh, to the stations he owned. He later became ill and uh, he sold it and it was picked up by uh, Tom Monahan. WSMN, meanwhile, had an opportunity to sell the property, so they sold the property and uh, the station wasn't able to be licensed immediately to go back on the air because the individual who bought the property wasn't interested in the radio station. So it went dark for a while until Tom Monahan purchased it several years ago. And now he's moved it into one location where he's running three radio stations, WSMN, the old OTW MVU, which is now WGHM, or they just became ESPN New Hampshire. And he bought a third radio station, WKBR in Manchester, which he's also operating as the other half of ESPN New Hampshire. So he's got the southern New Hampshire region pretty well situated and saturated uh, with, with those two stations. Meanwhile, WHOB became Frank FM. They originally moved to Hooksit. And then they were purchased by another group who moved them back to Nashua. MVU, successing station WGHM, ESPN New Hampshire, WSMN, they're located at 149 Main Street, which is upstairs over Bank of America. And uh, they, do, uh, they do a lot of local programming now in WSMN, starting at 6 in the morning till about two o'clock every afternoon. It's all local originated programs uh, and they're trying to generate some interest uh, by community members. And in AM radio today, that's what you have to do. You have to be a community station. Uh, I had the good fortune after working uh, in the first Bush administration and coming back, uh, I was hired by WMVU to do a talk show with uh, State Senator Mary Nelson, the Mary and Ed Show. And we concentrated on doing local commentary, local talk, every afternoon from 3 to 5. And it paid off. And Mary's connection paid off. Because when Bill Clinton, President Clinton, came to Nashua, there was only one radio station he came on. And everybody was clamoring for him. He came to us because of Mary Nelson. Because when he was first running for president, Mary was supporting him. And she went bowling with him one time. And he remembered that. <laughs> so it's connections. So he came on with us. Much to the chagrin of everybody, Channel 9, who he wouldn't give an interview to, uh, came into the studio. They had a camera. He was on the phone. They had a camera and a microphone so they could pick up something. And the Channel 9 reporter kept trying to edge in to, to, to ask a question. It was Nanette Hansen. I said, no, no, Nanette. You can't. In fact, the White House didn't want me asking questions because I was a Republican. So I got to say, but I'm also the general manager and president, so I will say hello to the president, welcome him, and I'll let Mary do most of it. And I did get to ask him one question. I, told, I asked him about the bowling excursion with Mary, and he just laughed. <laughs> but those are the kind of things that make New Hampshire special, and, and because of the primary, we get, we get the attention. You know, going back to the days at SMN, I remember one Saturday. Now, Saturday was pretty quiet at the station. The, the paper downstairs, the broadcaster, they were busy because that was the day they put the paper to bed. This particular Saturday, there was a lot of people at the station. I couldn't understand why. Then I figured it out. Former Governor Jerry Brown was coming in, and everybody thought he was going to be bringing his girlfriend with him, and they wanted to see her. Well, she stayed at the hotel. People were disappointed. They left and, and went off. Then the girls were all excited one day because Dennis Weaver came in the campaign, and they couldn't all wait to see him. Shirley MacLaine came in. She never signs autographs, but Frank T's got her to sign a, a record album. And it's probably somewhere in Frank's collection that's now the responsibility of young Frank Jr. somewhere in his house. But New Hampshire gives a, a great opportunity for aspiring young broadcasters who choose to move on. Uh, we've, had, uh, we've had several New Hampshire broadcasters, uh, most notably uh, Bob Lobel, who moved from uh, WGIR in Manchester to uh, Channel 4 and WBZ Radio in Boston. Susan Warnick, who moved from WGIR to Channel 5 in Boston. And along the way, she and Bob were married for a little while. Uh, Jackie Judd from Concord went on to be 
uh, a reporter anchor for ABC News uh, in, in uh, New York. If you happen to hear CBS radio at all, you may hear the name Barry Bagnetto. Barry started at WKXL uh, in Concord. That seemed to be the real breeding ground for those who were get there, uh, get cut their teeth in New Hampshire and then move on. There was another woman by the name of Judy Fertig who went on to uh, KDKA uh, in Pittsburgh. So it, it's a great training ground. And locally, uh, we had a few folks too over the years who, who went on and, and, and did great things beyond uh, radio in Nashua. Uh, when I used to do the color for Frank Tease when he was doing the high school play-by-play, -play, when we drive to exotic places like Keene, and inevitably it snowed every year we had to go around Dublin Lake, we would kind of do WSMN from A to Z. And we could do just about all the letters. For A, we had Herb Andrews. Herb uh, did the nighttime radio show. When my father first got there, the chief engineer's name was Pete Bagdasarian. Connie Sias was the continuity director when we first got there. After Bagdasarian came Don Ayers, and as I said, of course, Ernie Andrews. Kevin Farwell. Kevin has worked at, I think, every station in southern New Hampshire. He just can't let go. He's got it in his blood. And he's got a great voice, if you remember having heard him on the air. So Kevin was at WSMN, was at WOTW, was at WMVU, and he's done a little work uh, over at uh, WGHM as well. Gene Gerard, Adrian Gene Gerard, he did the Franco-American show on Sundays from 9 till noon. He was from Manchester and he was also a salesman. The receptionist, when my dad moved over to SMN, was named Hazel Painter. And then we had an announcer by the name of John Campbell. And there was a guy by the name of Kim Johnson. He went by the nickname Big Daddy. Big burly guy with a white beard. Then there was some guy named Lee Edwards. And that was me. See, when I started working with my dad, it was kind of hard to be Ed and Ed and so I just took and flipped everything and I became Lee Edwards, but I found out afterwards there was a Lee Edwards in Washington who was a nationally known syndicated columnist that worked in DC. Uh, a gentleman who's very successful today in his own right, Bob Malloy, Malloy Sound and Video, was an announcer engineer that worked with us. Norbert Silver was the chief financial officer of the corporation. And even though the family was in the hardware business, Tom Osgood dabbled a little bit in college, working in radio on the, on the weekends. And of course, we had Maury Parent. He was there as an announcer. He came back to do his French show after Gene Gerard passed away every Sunday, and then later went on to become uh, the president and general manager. Al Rock, Uncle Al as he liked to be called, who certainly uh, left his mark in radio, and he too was taken way too soon. Had a gentleman, his name was Steve Heinz, but on the air he went by Steve Shaw. And then the legendary uh, Frank Tease. Had an announcer, Jerry Wood. He followed Frank in the morning slot. His real name was Jerry Lamprin. He was the son of the late Supreme Court Chief Justice Edward Lamprin of Nashua, and his mother was Loretta Lamprin. And before Regis and Kathy Lee became the rage, they used to be listening with Loretta, his mom, at 9 a.m. in the morning, Monday through Friday, and she and Al Rock would mix it up pretty good. Then we had Yolanda Guthers. She was an executive assistant to the general manager. And for Z, we had Leo Zani, who was an announcer engineer with us. So we can just about do A to Z. I could cheat and do Q because it was Gerald Q. Nash and a few others. Uh, but o over time, the, a lot of good things have happened. Uh, the late Paul Harvey actually did his broadcast from the studios of WSMN after coming here to do, uh, be the speaker of the Chamber of Commerce annual dinner. And for those of you who grew up in Nashville, you can remember across the street where the public works garage is today and the police station, 
That was the landfill. And they had the teepee, which was the incinerator to burn the trash. The leaky teepee. And on a good day, the white of WSMN had a little silver tint to it. And I can remember growing up as a child, one of my first duties working there in the summer, before cutting the lawn, was to get up and wash the building down. But if you heard Paul Harvey portray what he was looking out at, and the snow was ashen covered, and, you know, it sounded, you know, just like a poem by Robert Frost. <laughs> he made it look elegant. But I mean, that, that was one of the things uh, he, he broadcast from here. Uh, I remember getting up at four o'clock in the morning to go over to Derry with my father and Al and Frank and a fellow by the name of Al Harrington and Don Ayers for the homecoming for Alan Shepard. What, what an event that was. In 76, we did a broadcast of the uh, Bicentennial Parade. Dale Lonroth and I were located on the little alcove roof over the entrance to the Hunt Building. Uh, Jerry Wood and Jennifer Backus were on the roof of what was then Nashville Federal Savings and Loan on Main Street. And uh, Frank Tease, and I forget who was with Frank, but they were down in front of City Hall and Al Rock was back at the studio kind of producing and coordinating the broadcast of the parade, which we felt was important for those who were shut in and, and, and couldn't, uh, couldn't attend. I remember the blizzard of 78, being at the station for four straight days. We got there when the snow started and we stayed there. It was myself, Frank, Al Rock, Dale Lonroth, and we just rotated shifts. And we stayed on all night. And I remember my uncle was down in Florida. I called him up just to talk to him. At about three o'clock in the morning, he was telling me how it was 84 degrees. And I said, yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, but we, we do those things for the community because being a community station, those are things you had to do. Uh, when Armin Roussel lost his life, as, when he was shot as the acting police chief, uh, we started a fund for his family with $1,590. And I remember standing down in front of uh, then Nashua Trust, now Villa Banca, uh, just taking donations from people. And some guy in a big black Cadillac from Massachusetts pulled up. And he put an envelope in the, in the can. I got back to the station. We opened the envelope. It was a check for $5,000. And it was a bank check, so you couldn't even tell who it came from. But we, we raised a considerable amount of money for the Roussel family. And, and again, that's what, what being in local radio was all about. And I, I often said that, you know, the, the thing I've missed most since leaving radio was, uh, was the games. I mean, I enjoyed the news part of it, but, but doing the games were, was fun. Uh, and so uh, people took me up on that. And, I had the honor of doing 27 out of the 31 Nashua BG games, including the first and last. And I've done every Nashua North-South game since the two schools began. So they, they, they've taken me out of mothballs for that. And three years ago, Chris Williams, the president of the chamber, had an idea that he wanted to do a chamber radio show. And so uh, got permission from my bosses. And so every Thursday on WSMN, I do the chamber report. Uh, it's strictly volunteer, and just so nobody has a problem, I also take an hour of leave every Thursday, <laughs> so no one can say I'm on the clock. But it's, it's been nice to, to still keep my finger in it, and it's also given me some opportunities to do other things. I never thought I would leave radio, but in 1983 an opportunity came along for me to go to work for Governor Sununu, and uh, I, I don't look back, that was a great opportunity. From there, I went and had an opportunity to work in the first Bush administration. And then I came back and I got back into radio. And then after MVU was sold, I worked at the chamber and I've been at the police department for the last 12 years. But things have changed dramatically over the years. Uh, back in the day, this is what we'd record things on. Real to real tapes. Now, originally when Matt and I were going to do this, I pulled out some old tapes because I got a bunch of them. Well, they don't have a reel-to-reel -reel tape machine at SMN or ESPN New Hampshire, so we couldn't dub off or anything. And then when you have commercials or actualities, they were on these. Not quite an eight track, but that's what those are. And they don't have one of those either. Now, 
you get things like this, or you can record on a thumb drive. And you just plug it into the computer and you edit with the computer. Unbelievable, the technology. But it also enables you to do other things. And then this, this, this current climate of the 24-hour news cycles on radio and TV, it, it certainly makes it, uh, makes it easy for those who are doing the, the covering and the reporting. So, so that's basically radio here in Nashua. Uh, moving forward with the technology advances, I think you're going to see it getting even more fine-tuned. I mean, right now, and when I was at MVU, we were licensed for 24 hours, and uh, at 6 p.m., we went all network. Didn't, didn't have to have anybody there babysitting. You just hoped that everything stayed on and <laughs> there were no power outages. Uh, and, and that's what's happening today. A lot of it is, is what they call canned material or network shows. You just push a button, leave it. The computer decides and tells the show coming in when there's a local break and stops the show and plays the commercial and, you know, literally runs by itself. But the human element uh, is still important. And that's why I was glad to see Tom Monahan uh, bring the station back and uh, try to get some local programming back on there. And, and, and I think for the most part, it, it works. You know, the days of broadcasting the automatic meetings are long gone because of Channel 16. Now you can watch them. And uh, if you don't live in Nashua, you can go online and you can watch them. So uh, th that's how much has changed. And I see more changes coming uh, further down the road. Uh, the biggest challenge right now for any station starting up is siting their antennas. When WSMN was sold, they sold the whole piece of property. So the three antennas that we had, and we affectionately called them Winkum, Blinkum, and Nod, those came down. Right now, Tom is running WSMN off of the ESPN New Hampshire tower, which is located in the mill yard. But to site the three towers in the area where they would need to be sited, which is out off Route 111A because it's a, a directional station by, by virtue of FCC edict, uh, would be next to impossible and very expensive. He thought he had a deal worked out with the city, but uh, it was very, very expensive to put them in the area of the landfill. It was almost a half a million dollars. And return on that investment is, is tough. Because again, AM stations are, are a tough go today. FM stations, because of their power and their signal strength, they tend to be uh, better revenue producers, but not by much. Again, the competition is out there. I mean, right now, with the new social media, SMN, ESPN, New Hampshire, they have Facebook, they have Twitter, they have a, uh, an email, they have a Facebook page, they have an email page. And you've got to have that stuff to be competitive today. It's not just like the old days. And before, we used to, used to have the old teletype machines, and we'd get our news off of that from either the United Press International or Associated Press. So they just go right online, do it that way. So uh, it's evolved. It's changed for the, for the better, for the most part. But certainly, it was a, it was a wonderful experience growing up in Nashua uh, and, and being involved uh, as a little kid carrying the boxes in the day my father left WOTW, went to WSMN. He did the news at OTW in the morning. At 10 o'clock, we walked into WSMN, and that began. So uh, it's been fun, and I appreciate this opportunity to uh, speak to you tonight. And if you've got any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you. Alan. How do, how do uh, <coughs> uh, local stations remain financially viable? You get some good investors that, that are willing to put some money in and, and not expect an immediate return on investment, and you just go out and you, and you sell it by doing the local things that, that a local radio station needs to do, and that is being involved in the community, being out there, supporting fundraisers, doing uh, high school athletics, because to me that's still the purest form of athletics today is high school. And no one's getting paid that I know of, and uh, the, the kids are out there because they want to be out there. Uh, and, and building a base with, with uh, the local businesses in your community. And, and even that approach is, has changed because of the influx of the national uh, large box stores. Uh, you're, you're talking with somebody out in California trying to tell them why they should be on the radio in Nashville, New Hampshire. 
And, you know, they probably don't even know where Nashua, New Hampshire is. You've got to tell them, yeah, we're just near Manchester. Uh, because there's, there's a perception that Manchester is the hub of New Hampshire. But as, as many mayors are fond to say, and Donna Lee is fond to say, Nashua is the, the engine that drives the state's economy. And, and people forget that. And part of the reason is, you know, you have the union leader in Manchester, you get channel lines, everybody thinks that it evolves around that. But really, Nashua is the economic engine uh, that drives the state. And so you've got to convince this guy in California of that. And, uh, you know, I know I used to, 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 to say, you know, if you want to use that station up there and pay, you know, $150 for a 60-second spot, well, I can give you four of those for the same price. And, uh, you know, having President Clinton come on that time, that helped us because we were able to do a little play in the, in the newspapers as well as a little promo saying, you know, when the president wanted to speak to Southern New Hampshire, who did he choose? Us. So, and, and again, you've got to have people that know the community. I mean, right now, George Russell does Nashua in the morning for, for WSMN. George is a little crazy, but his heart's in the right place, and he brings on different businesses. He's promoting things, and, and those are the things you've got to do to be successful and, and make AM radio run. FM radio, again, you've got a broader reach, and, and it's tough to compete with the WZIDs, WOKQs of the world. But if you find your niche, you find somebody who wants to let people in Nashua or Greater Nashua know about their business, then you keep pushing it and working it, it'll, it'll happen. Yes? How, one, how do you remember all those letters? <laughs> <laughs> do they really mean anything, or does somebody just pick them out of a hat? Well, WSMN was Weather, Sports, Music, and News. Uh, WTW was named after uh, Mrs. Wingate. WMVU, it was Merrimack Valley Broadcasting, so Merrimack Valley, MV. Uh, and, and some, I mean, there's really not too much rhyme or reason that goes into it. Uh, some people just take whatever letters might be available. Uh, like WDNH, the WOTW bot, uh, Dover, New Hampshire, DNH. But now it's WOKQ and it's doing 10 times as better. Uh, WCNL was Claremont. Newport, CNL, and, and sometimes that goes into it. Uh, WMUR started out as a radio station before it became Channel 9, and former Governor Murphy, M-U-R, Murphy. That, that, that was the rationale and, and, and reasoning there, and sometimes there's, there's, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Just one thing, uh, the W was for radio stations east of the Mississippi. Yes. A is the radio stations west of, west of the Mississippi. Oh, okay. And that still holds true today. That's the one thing with deregulation and everything that, that, that hasn't changed. And one of the things, and I know when, when Al Rock was alive, and, you know, when you'd have to do your license renewal every three years, you know, Al's biggest argument was we at WSMN here in little old Nashua had to do the same thing it's like WBZ in Boston had to do, but they had a whole staff of people that were responsible for license renewal, making sure the files were kept up and, and all that stuff. Whereas, uh, for the most part, Al had to do all that. I mean, you had to do community interviews with community leaders. So you'd have to have several sessions similar to this and try to get, like, I think you had to have 100 and get them into the room and tell us what you liked, what you didn't like, what we were doing well, what we weren't doing well. And he had to do that and he had to document that. And, and he had to do that in his spare time when he wasn't selling, when he wasn't on the air, uh, and, and, and it was true. And so deregulation kind of made it a little easier. You still had to maintain the files, but all I had to do was send in the postcard saying, yes, I did. <laughs> <coughs> yes? Talking about license renewal, what happened back, uh, you mentioned with OTW and the judge said they couldn't, the renewal was denied. Why, why did they deny it? There were some discrepancies in their uh, public file that somebody, if, if I were kind of vaguely recall it, that, that brought a challenge, and the FCC came and looked at it and uh, said, yep, they were right, and how can you explain this? And they, they didn't explain it to the commission's satisfaction. And so they said, okay, non-renewal. And, and like I say, there were six groups for each of the stations when they announced that they were going to split the license. And that really, uh, and I often joke, uh, Paul Shea was vice president of Bank of New Hampshire in, in the MVU group, and I often joked to Paul when I took over him as president and general manager, I said, boy, if I had half of what you guys spent on legal fees to get this license, we could be doing great, wonderful things. 
what it is. It's expensive because not only do you have to have a lawyer here, but you've got to have a lawyer in Washington that knows their way around the FCC. And, uh, and, and Mr. Wingate will tell you, you know, that, that was the biggest expense besides Al's time and effort to license renewal was paying the lawyer in Washington just to walk the box into the FCC and say, we're filing. And uh, I mean, we had a good lawyer, but you did all the work and, you know, you, you were paying Washington, D.C. Uh, hourly rates. But it was either that or you run the risk of, of not getting it. So, and deregulation did help in, in that respect. And, and I'd say 98% of all the radio stations did not stop doing their community things when deregulation came along. They still did whatever it was they were doing. Some may have cut back a little, but for the most part, everyone still maintained uh, service to their community. And that was the whole premise around license renewal. If you said you were gonna do this over the next license period, you had to be able to show beyond the reasonable doubt that you did it. Anyone else? Yes. Why did it take till 1946 for Nashville to get a commercial station? I don't know. That was before my time. Uh, I, I'm not sure why. Uh, you know, the, the stations around the state, and, and there's a great book that was written several years ago by Ed Bruder, who used to be the morning guy at ZID. It's called Granite and Ethier, and it kind of gives the history of uh, radio stations here in New Hampshire. And, and the funny thing was, I, I had read it years ago and I looked at it quickly, you know, getting ready for this presentation. Uh, most of the action was north of Concord, the Berlin area, uh, Laconia area uh, in, the, in the early days, and then Manchester and then Nashua finally caught up uh, in 46. But, you know, the, I don't know the reason. It used to be in the old days, you always had to do a number, certain number of PSAs per month, a year, yep. in order to get you. Does that still hold true? No. I mean, you still have to do some, but we were required, as, as Dearborn said, to do a number of public service announcements, in addition to our commercials. And you couldn't have more than 18 minutes of commercials an hour. And that was another argument that, that Al Rock and the station argued at the FCC. Come campaign time, you know, Wingate's Pharmacy, Nashua Auto, W.T. Grants, they were with you 365 days a year. But during election time, now all these politicians want their spots to go in, and those were counted against your 18 minutes. So you'd have to bump them to play the political spots. That eventually got relaxed, and, uh, you know, it's a good thing, because I don't know if you've watched Channel 9 during the last presidential cycle, but uh, if you saw a non-political ad or actually saw a program, uh, it was, you know, it, it was a good thing. But yeah, that was that was tough, especially with your longtime sponsors, and and things were sold a little differently then. You'd sell your newscast, you'd sell your weather forecast, you'd have sponsors for segments of like open line and and things like that. Now, they just sell things, and before you had to have separation. You couldn't run like Nashuato and Tully Buick back to back. There had to be separation. Now, I listen on the radio or watch TV, and they're like running four car dealers right, right in a row. Uh, and yeah, the furniture stores are the same. So I mean, that's, that's changed a little bit too. And uh, you know, like I said, most of the change has been good. Anyone else? Well, thank you. I hope uh, I've shed some light on the history of radio here. I brought a few old license plates that I found that we used to use. And, Al Rock uh, was famous for uniforms for when we go out on broadcasts, and uh, he liked red. So <laughs> our red blazers were, were well known. Does it still fit you? Unfortunately, it doesn't, Charlie. Oh, no. I, I, think this was the one, I think this was the one I had when I was in high school. Uh, but you, when know, it, you know who your friends are. Yeah, well, you know. Uh, Whenever we went on a remote broadcast or a special event that we were out there, you'd have to wear the uniform. It was the red blazer. It was a white shirt, black knit tie. I love these knit ties. And black slacks. And, and then uh, we used to do the citywide golf tournament. The station ran that for years. So we were allowed to get red knit <laughs> polo shirts with WSMN on them. So. Well, thank you all. It's been, it's been great. I hope I've shed some light on radio and how it's evolved here in Nashville, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here before you. Thank you. Thank you.